fellow weirdos. I'm Andy Negative, and today we're going to play through Pokemon Red using this very old and very outdated walkthrough from 1998. Alright weirdos, welcome to my second channel where we do uh, Pokemon stuff. So if you're into that, please just give a little subscriberino and maybe just uh, just obliterate that like button for the YouTube algorithm. In this video, I'm going to be playing through Pokemon Red following the uh, the instructions in this very old strategy guide like, as close as possible. And we're going to see just how good, bad... This strategy guide uh, really is, and if you should use it to play through the game, I guess. Ah! Pokemon Red and Blue were released in September of 1998 in North America, and somewhere around Christmas time, I believe, I was given my very own Game Boy Color, this one actually, and and my own copy of Pokemon Blue, this this one. Yeah, this one right here. At the tender age of 10, I was very excited. Pokemania was setting in and uh, and I was very, very bad at video games. And in fact, I'm still very bad at video games. Enter this Prima official strategy guide, Pokemon Red slash Blue version and how to play the game officially according to Nintendo. What's a strategy guide you ask? That's a great question. Well, but way, way back in the 1990s, the internet was uh, was not the behemoth of information that it is now. There were no websites dedicated to walkthroughs or forums full of fans solving game problems or let's plays on YouTube that you could watch to figure out how to get through a game. If you wanted to beat a game, you either did it the old fashioned way or you, or you bought yourself a strategy guide. This guide right here was released by one of the big names in strategy guides at the time, whatever that means, Prima. Written by Elizabeth Hollinger, this is a Nintendo sanctioned official strategy guide for, uh, for you to use to get through Pokemon Red and Blue. According to the back, this book includes a complete breakdown of Pokemon Island, including all cities, towns, streets, and dungeons. Pokemon Island? What is, what is that even? Whatever. Locations, statistics, and skills of all 150 Pokemon. That's right, 150. This is the beginning of a trend for this, for this book. Information on all learned skills, technical machines, and hidden machines. Whereabouts of all items. <coughs> Tips for beating all eight Pokemon trainers. Obviously, I imagine they mean the gym leaders, not just that there are only eight trainers in the game. It is funny to think of a version of Pokemon that has literally only eight trainers. Oh boy. And maps of every location. So we're gonna we're gonna open this bad boy up, crack it open, and we're gonna see how to play through Pokemon Red officially according to Nintendo. Let's do this. Part one. The start of the book has a wonderful long blurb about how Elizabeth fell into the world of Pokemon, playing the game in line at the grocery store, in bed late at night, basically saying that it had taken taken over her life. Mood. The book quickly covers some of the game basics like version exclusives, the types of evolution, how to capture Pokemon, leveling and training, and the trading mechanic. It also covers a few do's and don'ts like don't play with, oh, don't play with friends. Don't play this game with your friends. Do play with friends. Again, this is pre-internet after all. Don't focus on just one Pokemon. Challenge runners be damned. Do trade Pokemon. Do use items in battle and a few, and a few other things. All of the early pages are pretty basic stuff, but it's all useful to anyone who who may have never played the game before. The only weird thing here is when she talks about starters. She mentions that you should pretty much just pick your favorite, which I totally 100% agree with. Team Charmander! Char! However, the book points out that if you choose Squirtle and Bulbasaur, the first few gyms will be easier, which is which is a fact. But then it says that if you choose Charmander, you should make sure to pick up a Pikachu because that will make the first couple gyms easier. Which is interesting because in that same paragraph, it mentions that Squirtle and Bulbasaur have a type advantage over the first gym. Electric Pokemon most certainly do not. It then goes to say that Brock is a ground type gym. He literally has the word rock in his name. I you know what? I'm sure that this is a small error, just a, 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 a small oversight and is not going to be an overarching theme to the playthrough that we're about to do. <sighs> anyway, let's let's play the game. 
Part two, the playthrough. We start off the game as normal and I name myself Andy because that's my name. Then I name my rival Poop with three exclamation marks because I am a child. Quickly change the tech speed in battle animation because I forgot to do it on startup and grab the PC potion. Now it's time to choose our very first Pokemon. Oak forgets his grandson and I pick Charmander because the guide points out that it's the most difficult starter to play the game through and I intend to pick the hardest way of doing things that the guide offers me in every instance. Also, Charmander is the best starter. Fight me. Time to show Poop what's up. I end up using the PC potion just to be on the safe side, but I wipe the floor with Poop. Wait, wait. what? Ugh. <laughs> Looks like subscribe has slightly higher speed, which will be good for critical hits later. Now let's get out of here and flirt with Poop's sister. The guide says that she has a crush on us and that we need the town map. I, I literally never used it in the entire playthrough because this book has all the maps in it, but I we have to follow the guide, so. With that out of the way, we can hit the road. The guide says basically to talk to every NPC because you never know who will give you a free item. However, it also lays out most of the NPCs that give you items in the game and shows you all the items you can pick up on each section of the map. So we could just be anti-social, which totally works for me. We try our hand at being a delivery boy and then get the Pokedex. Finally, I can start catching Pokemans. I load up on Pokeballs and a few antidotes just in case, and it's time to catch our first wild Pokemon. The book says to go catch our first Pokemon on Route 22 for whatever reason, and then level up your two Pokemon to do the optional rival battle. The first Pokemon I ran into was Nidoran female, so I guess that's what we're going with. I named her Bianca because that's funny to me for whatever reason, and then got these two trained up. 20 minutes later and my team members are at level nine. Time for the first optional rival match. This fight was brutal. The Pidgey dropped Subscribe's accuracy so low that I needed to use my free potion. Squirtle demolished Bianca and Subscribe held on with just five HP. Apparently two level nines is not a great way to do this battle, but I made it through somehow. All right, let's move on and holy crap, look at this. The guy literally put a Giovanni block on page 13. This is a huge spoiler for the main story. Huge, huge spoiler. Oh man, you aren't supposed to find out who the final gym trader is until the very end of the game. I know, I know that it's an old game, but keep in mind this book came out shortly after the game was released in North America. I get that maybe it made more sense for the layout of the book and for printing it, but dude, a spoiler warning would have been great. Yeesh. I really hope that these poor layout choices aren't gonna be a recurring theme through this playthrough. <laughs> It should be noted that this guy does not point out the potion hidden in the tree near the drunk guy, or any of the hidden items in the entire game for that matter. Whereabouts of all items my butt. According to the guy, the only thing to do on Route 2 is catch a bug Pokemon, so let's do that. After about 10 minutes of hunting, I finally came across a Weedle, caught it, and named it Caterpie because that's funny. Just imagine how much faster I could have caught that Weedle if I'd have taken 10 steps up into Verdian Forest. Hmm. The guide suggests picking up a Pikachu in Viridian Forest, so we find one and add it to the team and name it Mellow Yellow. Entering Pewter City, the guide says that Brock is a really tough cookie, and if you choose Charmander, you need a good bug type Pokemon on your team. Hmm. Luckily, we have Caterpie, or er, Weedle, and it learns the bug attack Twin Needle at level 20. All right, um, well, let's train up and see if we can take on Brock with, with our Nintendo sanctioned team. Ugh. 45 minutes later, Subscribe is level 14 and Caterpie is a level 12 Beedrill. Let's give this gym a shot. As I figured, Caterpie was basically useless in this fight. Bug moves aren't super effective against rock or ground, and Beedrill basically knows Poison Sting and Fury Attack, which is a normal move anyway. Against all odds, Caterpie managed to whittle down Geodude decently far before getting knocked out, and then Subscribe came in with an Ember for the win. Onyx was painfully easy, but did you know that apparently Brock can full heal a Pokemon on its first turn? I burned the Onyx with Ember, and he full healed before his attack after he would have had to have chosen an attack. Gen 1 mechanics are so friggin' weird. Anyway, Subscribe managed to take down Onyx without taking almost any damage because its special stat is, it's, it's hot garbage. Isn't fire supposed to be not effective against rock? Oh man, Onyx is just the worst Pokemon. Subscribe evolved during the fight and with that, we have the Boulder Badge, so let's move on. The book suggests adding a Jigglypuff to our party, so we grab one outside Mount Moon. It also says to skip the $500 Magic Carp, which is kind of a bummer because I always, always get the $500 Magic Carp on my playthroughs of Red and Blue, but not this time. Sorry, Magic Carp. 
Heading through Mount Moon, I catch a Geodude and a Paris because they seem like fun Pokemon and not because I read ahead in the book. At the end, I chose the Dome Fossil because I am an agent of chaos. <laughs> Out on Route 4, we grab an Ekans because the guide tells us we need one of the version exclusives. I named him Terabad because Ekans is just, just so awful. Just so awful. The guide tells us that we need to have our Pokemon at about level 25 to do the Misty fight. It also suggests using Paris. Glad I grabbed that back in Mount Moon. So I guess we best get training. Normally, I'd go up to Nugget Bridge and train against a plethora of trainers above Cerulean City, but according to the book, we need to fight Misty first. So it looks like that tiny patch of grass outside Mount Moon is our only option. We are in for a long grinding session. After two hours of grueling training, Paris hit level 24 and evolved into Parasect. The grind was unbelievably tedious. Paris is weak to two out of three of the Pokemon you can encounter in this patch of grass, and slow as heck. I could hardly last more than one or two fights before having to go back and heal at the Pokemon Center for most of the grind. Finally, with my team around level 24, it's time to take on Misty. This fight is hilarious. I had fully expected Paris to be useless in this battle because despite the fact that it's part grass, it doesn't learn a grass move until level 30. What I had forgotten was that Starmie is part psychic, so Leech Life literally busted it in three hits. This was a super easy fight. That's one point for this guide. For some reason, the guide only lists three of your rival's four Pokemon, which is strange, but we're super overleveled and we just steamroll over his team. Due to the power levering for the Misty battle, there is nothing of note going on in this whole next section, so let's head down toward Vermilion. Getting to Vermilion City, we have the same issue as Cerulean. The guide lays out that the gym leader is the first thing to do in town. Only problem is you need cut in order to get to the gym. So we have to break away from the guide for this for this one section so that we can go do the SSN. Even though for some reason they, they want you to do the gym battle first? I, I don't know. Once again, the book is pretty fast and loose with the information on your rival, but we crush him, grab cut, and now it's on to Lieutenant Surge. For the Surge battle, the book tells you to teach Dig to a ground Pokemon that you may have picked up along your travels. The only ground Pokemon that you can encounter up to this point is Geodude. Sure is lucky I picked one up back in Mount Moon. Totally luck and not me reading ahead in the guide. The layout of this book is infuriating. It's not like if we were to take 10 steps out of Vermilion City, there isn't an entire area full of literal ground Pokemon with Dig in their name. <sighs> okay. Geodude it is. And we crush Surge. This battle's barely even worth talking about. Moving on, now the book finally tells us to take Diglett Cave and get Flash. Well, sort of. It mentions that Diglett's Cave leads to Pewter City. There was also a mention of Flash back on page 15 when we were first passing through Vermilion City. So hopefully you remember that and then can put together yourself that you need to take Diglett's Cave to Pewter City to get Flash before you go to Rock Tunnel and can't get through it. The guide pretty much tells you to make a beeline for Rock Tunnel from here. So I stopped and grabbed the bike along the way and totally got sidetracked and 100% forgot to get Flash because I was too wrapped up in what the book was telling me to do. <laughs> All right, I guess we're backtracking. And we're back. I evolved Bianca to Nido Queen and taught her Bubble Beam so she can carry us through Rock Tunnel. On the other side of Rock Tunnel, I never realized that there are no visible items in this entire dungeon. I totally remember there being items. Oh, my dog. Is that... Is that a Mandela effect? Do you remember there being items? Are we living in an alternate timeline where the strategy guides are terrible and there's no item? I think a note happened here, so we head into Lavender Town. The guide says that there is nothing to do here until we have the Sylph Scope. We actually could do the rival battle, but there's no mention of it, so I guess we're moving on to Celadon. That rhymed. Nice. All the early grinding before Misty has made it so that I'm basically steamrolling every trainer I meet. I'm gonna try to keep my levels so they're only as high as the next leader's strongest Pokemon to try to keep things interesting. We avoid most of the trainers and hit Celadon City. Now, early in the game, it seemed like there was a lot of suggestions about interesting Pokemon to catch and add to your party. The example, the Pikachu in Viridian Forest or the Jigglypuff outside of Mount Moon. But while the book lists all the available Pokemon that you can catch in each route, it hasn't explicitly suggested getting any Pokemon for about 15 pages or so. Well, that's all about to change. The book tells you where to get Eevee so we can add it to our team, evolve it, and have an actual good electric Pokemon on our team for once. And I totally forgot that Jolteon doesn't learn Thunderbolt, and I taught the TM for Thunderbolt to Pikachu earlier. <sighs> Crap. I guess we aren't adding Eevee to our party then. <sighs> Oh well, on to Erica. The guide finally does the right thing and suggests a fire type Pokemon for this battle. Actually, it says almost any Pokemon works well against grass. Look, 
I know that grass isn't super good in Gen 1, but there's only like four types that have an advantage over it, and most of the rest of the Pokemon types are neutral to it. My guess is that Elizabeth has just overleveled from all the unnecessary pre-gym grinding, and so the battle was just super easy. The Erica fight was easy, but slow. I basically had to heal off status effects every other turn, or wait out wraps and binds. Man, Gen 1. Subscribe got pretty close to going down off a of petal dance, but snuck in a critical ember to finish off the dancing vile plume. Next up is the rocket game corner, which shouldn't take too much effort. We power through the hideout and Giovanni is, he's a joke at this point. His Kangaskhan used turn one rage and was locked in for the entire fight. What a fool! Now that we have the Sylph scope, we can head back to Lavender Town and finish the spooky ghost tower. It's at this point where I think the guy pretty much starts to fall apart. It literally says, ghosts are difficult until you find out which Pokemon do best against them. Uh, okay. So you're not gonna even make a suggestion of what type to use at all? Just gotta figure it out on our own? Nothing? Okay. Obviously, I don't expect a 20-year-old book to play the game for me, but come on! A page later, it mentions that normal and fighting types don't do well against Ghost. That's the understatement of the century. Clearly, Elizabeth just didn't try to figure out what the type advantage was for ghosts, so it wasn't included in the book because it's just not that important because you'll never come up with against another ghost again after the ghost tower. I know there were issues with the with the type balancing in this game when they first made it and, and the type chart being a little wrong, but you, the, in the book, it literally shows you that the, that the three ghosts are part poison. It says it in the back of the book. Like, how could you not... How could you not figure this out on your own? Before we do Spooky Tower, we have to defeat our rival. This was a joke because I'm almost five levels higher than his strongest Pokemon. It's clear this battle was intended to happen before Erica, but once again, this guide is making the game too easy or too hard, whatever. While in Spooky Tower, I picked up a Ghastly because I love ghost Pokemon and I think Gengar is probably the raddest Pokemon ever designed. Uh, also for a very specific reason uh, later on, totally didn't read ahead again. I would never do that. I forgot how brutal switch training is in Pokemon Tower because all the trainers confuse and paralyze. None of the battles are hard, they're just super tedious and annoying. Luckily, there's a heal pad on floor three. We beat Team Rocket, rescue Mr. Fuji, and get the Poke Flute. And now it's off to Saffron City. Wait a second. The book literally jumps from from, from Spooky Tower to Saffron City. We, we need a bottle of soda for the guards, for the thirsty guards, they're thirsty. But they didn't win. I mean, but I just, I, ah! Once again, we hit on one of the major issues of this book and it's the dog damn layout. You'd think mentioning an item around where we needed the item would be the most pertinent place to mention it. Or maybe even where you would get that item. You know, they, oh, this is where it's sold. You should pick this up. It's gonna be important later. Instead, almost 20 pages back, at the bottom of a page is a small blurb saying that the guard might want some water or soda pop. Who's gonna remember that when there's literally hours of gameplay in between when you read that and getting to Saffron City? Ah! Okay, so back to Celadon City we go so we can get a stupid bottle of soda pop and then we head into Saffron City. First thing the guide wants us to do is finish Sylph Co. That's fine because I need to power level a bunch. Sabrina's highest level Pokemon is 43 and mine are like level 30. So we got our work cut out for us. As this is the first playthrough video that I've ever done, something I did not foresee is the uh, sheer file size of recording everything that you're doing when you're playing. Uh, every hour is about a gig of space on my hard drive, and I've been playing for about 17 hours already, so um, I'm running out of space real quick. It's piling up. Uh, so from this point forward, I'm only just gonna kind of tag in to record the more important stuff and leave out the grinding and the and the pointless trainers and the wandering around and whatnot. Spooky Boy evolved in the hideout and now it's time for Rival Fievel. Once again, the guide is incredibly inconsistent with regards to your rival. There's literally no information regarding his team. I guess we're going in blind. This battle was actually kind of tough. Poop's Pokemon were five to eight levels higher than mine and I was worried about Alakazam but managed to put it to sleep and Paris took it out without much issue. We grab the free Lapras and head to take on Boss Rocket. Honestly, the Giovanni fight was easier than Rival Fievel. For some reason, his Nidoqueen only used Scratched against my Nidoqueen? What a great way to lose a battle. Now that we've freed Sylph Co and got the Master Ball, it's time to take on the two Saffron City gyms. First up is the Fighting Trainer, which is a total cakewalk, since none of the Pokemon, except for literally Hitmonchan, can even touch Spooky Boy. I took Hitmonlee and I named it Hitmonchan because that is hilarious. Now it's time to take on Sabrina. So here we have another major issue with this guide. 
First off, Sabrina is arguably the most difficult mid-game trainer. It makes way more sense to battle Sabrina later, like after Koga. There isn't really a good place to train because we aren't letting ourselves get ahead of the guide, so we can pretty much only rely on the actual gym trainers to use to gain experience. Also, the gym blurb says that the best Pokemon to use against Sabrina are, you guessed it, ghost and bug types. In case you're unaware, the only bug type moves that you can get in Gen 1 are Twin Needle and Leech Life. Leech Life is a base 20 power move and Twin Needle is only on Beedrill, which is a terrible, terrible Pokemon. Also, the only three ghost Pokemon that you can get in the game are part poison, which means Psychic is super effective against them and they are effectively useless in the Sabrina battle. I'm not really surprised by this glaring mistake here because Game Freak made some mistakes balancing out the game. Ghost is supposed to be super effective against Psychic, but with the poison typing, it nullifies that entirely. There are no really good checks to Psychic in Gen 1, which means that it's OP and just, just unbelievably strong. My major issue is that at the beginning of the book, Elizabeth spent an entire page talking about how she fell into this world of Pokemon and spent hours upon hours playing it. But you're telling me that she didn't try to use a ghost Pokemon against the Psychic Gym and then having them immediately die, thus making you realize that, oh, the information that I have is clearly incorrect. Why is that? And then not put that incorrect information into the guide about how to beat the game? She would have literally had to have this happen to her. It would have, it would have happened. It would have happened. Anyway, Anyway, enough complaining. Let's put Spooky Boy up front and try on this battle. Arceus, take the wheel. And Spooky Boy died immediately. This battle was brutal. I lost most of my team and Paris just barely held on from a critical side beam for the knockout. Just insane. Let's move on. On Route 12, we finally have another suggested Pokemon encounter. Snorlax. There's a nice mention that if you've already been to Fuchsia City, how though, and have Ultra Balls, that it'll be an easy catch. Otherwise, you'll need a big supply of Super Balls to... Wait, does that say Super Balls? Oh man, it does! <laughs> what the heck is a Super Ball? Obviously, they confuse Great Balls for Super Balls, which is just hilarious to me. Unless, maybe the Super Ball is actually the mythical GS Ball of Legend! Anyway, we catch the Snorlax on the first Super Ball, er, Great Ball, and we head off. Now that we're through Route 12, we can finally head into Fuchsia City, and the next section of the book is Cycling Road. <sighs> the book wants us to backtrack all the way to Celadon City so we can take Cycling Road down to Fuchsia. We were so close! Yeah, fine. 10 minutes later and we're at the second Snorlax. I kill it dead because we don't need to. Grab the HM for fly. Realize that I'm gonna need a flying Pokemon. Cry for five minutes straight because the book hasn't suggested a single flying Pokemon for me to catch. And then go for a nice bike ride to clear my head. After flying down Cycling Road, we catch a Spearow. Get, get it, cause a uh, flying type. And we're, we flew down the, to the, to the fly, with, from fly to the flying. It's a flying, it's a flying birds! And finally get into Fuchsia City. First thing first, we've got Koga's Gym. According to the guide, the best type of Pokemon to use against Koga's poison team is offensive Pokemon. That's Pokemon who swear a lot, by the way. Oh, well, gee, here I was planning on defending my way to victory. Thanks for taking five seconds to check the type chart, Elizabeth. Since this strategy guide has basically dropped all pretenses of actually having any idea how to play this game, I'm gonna make some changes to my team based around my superior knowledge of a 20-year-old children's game. First up, I wanna add Snorlax because he's a beast. I have to think long and hard about this switch, putting great focus into the critical decision that stands before me. Nah, I get rid of Geo, bro that guy. Hello, Dr. Danger. I also taught Spooky Boy Psychic because he's a powerful offensive Pokemon. Oh, and Psychic sweeps poison as we've, as we've established. Now that we're all lubed up and good to go, it's time to take on the Poison Gym. While in the gym, Subscribe evolved into Subscribizard. Subscribe to the f***ing channel for Charizard. Ah! Unsurprisingly, I wrecked Koga without taking any damage at all because he felt the need to use an X attack on every one of his Pokemon. Also because Psychic is broken in Gen 1. No thanks to the strategy guide, of course. I guess we can move along and do whatever malarkey they want us to do next. According to the guide, I should only go to the Safari Zone if I have a few hours to spend searching around. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Ain't nobody got time for that. I gotta get through this challenge so I can get back to playing the TCGO. I'm just gonna truck through the Safari Zone, grab the gold teeth, grab Surf, and then get the heck out of Dodge. Interestingly, if you look at the available Pokemon list for the Safari Zone, it doesn't list Dratini as a fishing encounter. However, you can totally get Dratini in the first fishing area. 
That's one more point for this amazing, amazing strategy guide. With that, we move on to Cinnabar Island. And unfortunately, we have to go through Seafoam Island to get there. I have no intention of catching Articuno because legendaries are busted. However, the guide doesn't actually tell you how to get through Seafoam Island. It, it just says push boulders around until you figure it out. Great. And now I'm at Articuno. <sighs> I might as well give a shot at trying to catch it. All right. Turns out Super Balls, or Great Balls, don't even work on Legendaries in Gen 1. Since I wasn't planning on catching it, I don't have any Ultra Balls. So I wipe for the first time in this challenge. Good thing this isn't a Nuzlocke. I did not want to start this over again. Anyway, off to Cinnabar. We need to go into the Pokemon Mansion to get the key to Cinnabar Gym. This will be a good chance for us to level up a little bit. Here's an interesting tidbit. The guide says that not only is Blaine locked away by a key, but then you have to fight trainer after trainer before you reach the final barricade. There is literally no mention of the fact that you can just walk up to the computers and answer a simple question and then totally avoid the trainer battles in this gym. I'm pretty sure that the guy at the beginning of the gym even says that you can bypass all of the trainers by just answering questions. Still, I battle all the trainers because free experience experience is free experience. Luckily, the guide actually got the type advantage right for Blaine, and Bianca makes quick work of his team. I was a little worried about Arcanine because it's five levels higher than Bianca, but for some reason it used Roar, which did nothing, and then Blaine healed, and so I took no damage. Let's head back to the Viridian and finish up the gym challenge. An interesting mistake in the book shows the information panel for the Pokemon Mansion printed a second time on the next page as the info panel for Route 21 an oversight, but I was disappointed when I didn't find a magmar swimming around in the ocean. It's just the attention to detail in this book is, is astounding. <laughs> now it's time for the final Giovanni fu- wait, where's the info panel for- oh right, they spoiled it way back on page 13 at the beginning of the book. All right, let's finish this gym challenge so we can get onto the Elite Four. Looks like they've got the type advantage for the gym correct- wait, 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 wait. The book says that the gym uses only ground types, but only three of the trainers in the gym even have ground type Pokemon on their team. It's literally a combination of fighting, normal, flying, and ground type Pokemon. I'm really not trying to nitpick, but Yeesh! I like how Giovanni claims he's the greatest trainer ever, but then spends most of the fight setting up guard specs and never actually dealing any damage. I switched in my level 30 Dr. Danger to take a hit and ended up knocking out a Dug Trio that was 20 levels higher. Snorlax is a monster. I thought Rhydon was gonna be a problem, but I put it to sleep and Bianca clobbered it with a critical surf. Get wrecked! All right. One more rival battle before the Elite Four, and once again, there's no information about, about his team at all. This battle is theoretically more difficult than the Giovanni fight. And still, the guy refuses to accept that your rival is even worth mentioning. How surprised they'll be when they get to the end of the Elite Four. No spoilers! Well, sh this fight was a lot harder than expected. Actually, this battle was pretty easy, except I almost got spanked by Alakazam. It took out four of my Pokemon. This is gonna be a huge issue when we face him again as a champion. We'll need to do a lot of pre-Elite 4 grinding. Nothing much to say about Victory Road, except for some reason the guide calls Moltres Moltos. This isn't even just like a one-time spelling mistake either. Literally every mention of Moltres in this section of the book puts it down as Moltos. Weird. Also, literally every encounter in Victory Road is listed as being a rare encounter, even Zubats. How is that possible? Maybe Prima should get a new editor. So, you know, I'm available. We finally make it to Indigo Plateau, which means it's time for the Elite Four, baby. First things first, my team is nowhere near ready, so we're going to need to make some changes and do a bunch of training. Right off the bat, the book tells you to use Grass-type Pokemon against Lorelei. Grass-type Pokemon are literally weak to Ice types, but what, whatever you say, we're well past being able to rely on this book for, for useful information anyway. We've got a proper typing for Bruce, which is, which is good. There's no helpful information about Agatha because once again, Elizabeth never put together the whole poison type thing. And apparently against Lance, we're supposed to use ice types. This is good advice. And dragon types. This is bad advice because up until this point, the guy literally has not told us where to get any dragon Pokemon. And the only dragon move in the game is Dragon Rage, which is which does 40 damage every time it attacks only. 
Also, apparently a Pokemon with Hyper Beam to take them out quick. I'm calling malarkey on that. If I were to use a Caterpie with Hyper Beam, I guarantee it ain't gonna take out that Dragonite. I decided to go get the old Amber and add Aerodactyl to my team, and after two solid hours of grinding in Victory Road, it's time to take on the Elite Four, whether we're ready or not, which we're probably not. There's a good chance I'm underleveled, but at least it'll make for some interesting gameplay. This is what my team looks like before the Elite Four. Drop a comment and let me know if you think I can win or not. I don't have high hopes. All right, here we go! The Lorelei fight goes quickly because I decided to go against the guide's better judgment and not use a grass pipe Pokemon. Mellow Yellow basically sweeps everything. Subscribe flies in to launch a flamethrower knockout on Jinx, and then Lapras survives a Thunderbolt but gets fully paralyzed, so we finish the battle with no damage. Next is Bruno, and Bianca easily takes out the Onyxes with Surf. Squawkers is fast, dealing with Hitmonchan and landing a critical fly on a two times X defended Hitmonlee. Squawkers gets a good hit on Machamp, but the Machamp returns with a huge submission, bringing Squawkers down to 3 HP. Luckily, Squawkers holds on and lands a fly for the knockout. Agatha is up next, and I'm a little worried about her Gengar. My Haunter is 15 levels lower, and I may not be able to deal with it. Apparently, I was worried for no reason, because her ghost just kept spamming Dream Eater while I was awake, and the final Gengar just tried to toxic me a bunch, even though Spooky Boy is immune. That was way easier than expected. Time for Dragon Trainer Lance, and I forgot to hit record on this fight. Okay, you'll just have to settle for my recap. Gyarados goes down easy to Mellow Yellow's Thunderbolt. I send out Bianca, and due to the awful coding in Gen 1, both Dragonairs just spam agility because it's a psychic move, which is a super effective against Bianca's poison typing. I switch in Mellow Yellow against Aerodactyl, and it gets hit with a Hyper Beam, but it tanks the hit with 11 HP left over and lands a critical Thunderbolt for the takedown. The final Dragonite just spams ability, so a Body Slam and a Blizzard from Bianca gets the win. Better make sure I'm recording again. All right, we're good. And we're finally here. The Pokemon champion, and finally the guide admits that your rival is a legitimate trainer who deserves to have his team recognized. His Pokemon are around 10 to 15 levels higher than mine, so this will probably be a brutal fight. Fingers crossed. I hope that this guide prepared me for the ultimate battle. First up is Pidgeot. Mellow Yellow manages to get off two Thunderbolts and takes Pidgeot out while it's charging up for a Sky Attack. In comes Alakazam. As I figured, this Pokemon is a huge problem. It takes out Paris with a critical Psychic before Paris can get off a Spore. Not good. I switch to Squawkers and try to confuse Alakazam, but miss twice and Squawkers goes down. This isn't looking good. I switch and subscribe and Alakazam tries to recover at full health. A critical slash brings it way down. Alakazam throws up Reflect, but two more critical slashes take it out. Phew. Next is the Rhydon, but Bianca drowns it with a Surf in one hit. Arcanine comes out, and Bianca does big damage with an Earthquake. The Arcanine tries to roar, which does nothing, and Bianca knocks it out with another Earthquake. Executor is out, and I full restore subscribe and whittle it down with flamethrowers while it spams Hypnosis. Pathetic. Last but not least is Blastoise. Mellow Yellow does big damage with a Thunderbolt, tanks a Blizzard like a champ, and then Thunderbolts for the win. And with that, we are the Pokemon Champion, and the run is over. Or it would be, but there's one last thing the guide wants us to do. We traveled back to Cerulean City and we surf down to enter the fabled Unknown Dungeon. In the basement of this gargantuan maze hides the single most powerful Pokemon in the Kanto region. This is what all the training has been for, the final hurdle to overcome, the single greatest challenge in the Pokemon universe. We need to painstakingly whittle down this insanely high-leveled Pokemon in an epic battle of endurance and then survive as we throw Ultra Ball after Ultra Ball at it, hoping to catch this monstrous beast before it wipes out our entire team. The thus proving we are a Pokemon master. Nah, the book just says to use a Master Ball, so we're, we're gonna do that. And that's it, we're done. That completes our run of Pokemon Red using the Nintendo officially sanctioned Prima Strategy Guide. So, final thoughts. Honestly, this guide starts off pretty decently. There's some obvious mistakes early on, and it most certainly doesn't cover everything that the game has to offer like it claims that it does. It's as we progress into the mid game that the guide really starts to fall apart. By the end, it's mostly just a large book of maps with mostly correct information on where to find things and the levels of big trainers. In terms of being a strategy guide, I think it misses the mark in a big way. There's wrong information, bad type matchups, and even points where the guide literally doesn't know what the player's supposed to do and just tells you to figure it out for yourself. 
that just really doesn't scream strategy guide to me. My biggest issue with this whole guide is the layout. It has you jumping around and backtracking, leaving critical pieces of information in, in hard to find places, and it just even glosses over critically important things. As far as I can find, Elizabeth Hollinger wrote over 40 strategy guides during her time at Prima, many of them being in the few years surrounding the initial release of Pokemon in North America. Prima was a small company at the time, and I can only imagine that Elizabeth was one of very few writers tasked with writing strategy guides for an abundance of games. Given that she was probably under pretty heavy deadlines, I can excuse that the book is not perfect. I mean, you know, Gen 1 isn't perfect, right? <laughs> Elizabeth went on to write strategy guides for basically every Pokemon game from Gen 1 through Gen 3 and probably learned a lot about Pokemon along the way. I don't want to sit here and say that she did a bad job, because honestly I don't think that she did. This is one of two officially sanctioned strategy guides for a, a child children's game that no one thought we'd be talking about 20 plus years later. Everyone makes mistakes, everyone learns from their mistakes. So I can't really blame Elizabeth for her guide having flaws, especially when Gen 1 is a game that is just riddled with flaws itself. Did it infuriate me as a kid when I took a ghost type Pokemon up against Sabrina because it said it was the best type matchup and I just got wiped out in one move? Yes. Was it infuriating backtracking a ton during this playthrough? <laughs> you betcha. Should the editor maybe have checked the spelling of Moltres with the Pokedex entry at the back of the book to make sure the spelling was correct? Perhaps. Did I have fun re-experiencing a game that I've been playing for 20 plus years as if I were playing it for the first time? Honestly, yeah. So I had a blast doing this playthrough and I think that that's probably the most important thing. So thank you Elizabeth Hollinger for making an okay strategy guide for my favorite game and giving me just the best content that I could use to feed the ever hungry internet beast. I hope that if you ever see this video that it doesn't make you feel bad because honestly, you got paid to write a bunch of books about Pokemon and we, we should all be so lucky. And that's it for this this video. We're done with the playthrough. Uh, let me know down below if you enjoyed this kind of video. If I've never done it before. And if you're into this kind of thing, maybe I could get my hand on some more guides and we could do something more like this. Uh, if you if you thought this video was fun and exciting or entertaining or whatever, please just obliterate that like button and do a little subscriberino for me so that I know that you enjoy that you enjoy this. Just do the YouTube thing. Do the YouTube thing. Uh, that's it. I have a main channel where I do music. I talk about the music industry. I, I do original music and stuff like that, which you can check out, but you don't have to. And uh, other than that, I, I have lots of other videos on this channel about opening Pokemon card packs, and I'm going to do more playthroughs and Nuzlogs, and it's going to be a good time. So thank you for watching. I really appreciate your time, and uh, I've been Andy Negative, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye! Bye!